Okay, let's continue into uh, chapter 11. So like we said earlier, uh, Daniel 11 is going to look very briefly into future events, uh, shall we say, Babylon being overtaken by the Persians, then by the Greeks, uh, and then that breakup of Alexander the Great's four generals and how that's going to return into a, a long-standing conflict uh, between, uh, well, what we could call Egypt and Syria, but actually it would be the Ptolemies to the south and the Syrians, and correction, and the uh, Seleucids to the north. And then in verse 21, we start to see this transition of historical into future. Uh, keep in mind, one thing that's very important in all this, and that is the general pattern of prophecies, especially prophecies of end time events, have a, like a near and far type of fulfillment of prophecy. So a, a near fulfillment um, could be uh, Antiochus Epiphanes. It could be a uh, General Titus. It could be uh, the fall of, of Jerusalem in 70 AD, where the far, the ultimate, the core of the prophecy is really about end time events. So why do we have a uh, dual, sometimes even more than two type of fulfillments? Well, I think for starters, it's because it's the earlier fulfillments that are partial that gives us insight as to how this is going to come to, to being in the end, where we might say, I don't see how this could happen. Well, when we have something historical, at least historical to us, then it's like, ah, now I can see how that could happen. You know, this is, you, you, this is something that you, you just can't make up. And it's just like you wouldn't believe it unless you experience it or, or read about it. So um, that's, it's a very important part of uh, prophecy. So in this last section, uh, starting at verse 21, chapter 11, there'll be the emergence of the little horn. Um, the Antichrist, before the tribulation begins, remember, uh, there's three and a half years before the abomination of desolation is set up, and then that will trigger the great tribulation. Uh, then it's going to talk about, starting verse 31, his conquest during the tribulation. And then uh, Israel's deliverance and resurrection after the tribulation will be... Uh, covered in, in three verses in chapter 12. And then it goes on to more of a, shall we say, a parathetical of uh, more details about the tribulation that is going to happen during this time. So without further ado, let's go on. Daniel chapter 11. We're going to pick up around verse 2 where it says, three more kings shall rise in Persia, and a fourth, and then a mighty king shall arise, and who shall rule Who shall rule with great dominion? And as soon as he has arisen, his kingdom shall be broken and divided. Okay, so that would be Alexander the Great. Uh, his kingdom shall be plucked up and go to others besides these. So that then would go to his generals and the Seleucids and the Ptolemies, and there's two other kingdoms, but it's actually more than ever just these two giants uh, that uh, we will read about. And then verses 5 through 20, it goes back and forth with all these future wars uh, that will uh, occur between the Ptolemies and the Seleucids. And uh, this is all history, so this is something that we could easily you know, I don't know, pick up uh, Encyclopedia Britannica, maybe even Wikipedia and get a good understanding. But there's something that's very important in all this. And that is, you know, first and foremost, we always have to ask the question, why is this recorded in scripture? Um, there's several reasons why. One is just the historical accuracy that validates the prophecy itself, but then also, it's very important to look in the, the, the foreshadows, the, 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 uh, uh, the types of what's going to be ultimately fulfilled. And in this case, I think there's something that might be worth paying attention to, and that's the king of the south and the king of the north. 
And we read it back and forth, back and forth, these kings, uh, starting verse five, where the king of the south shall be strong, and then the daughter of the king of the south shall come to the king of the north, and then from a branch of her roots one shall arise, um, uh, and he shall come against the army and, and shall prevail, and he shall also carry off to Egypt, and then the king of the south shall come out and fight against the king of the north, and many shall arise against the king of the south, and the king of the north shall come and throw up siege works and take a well-fortified city, and he shall stand in the glorious land, that would be Israel, with destruction in his hand. And of course, he, which was uh, foreshadowed uh, by Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, however, Antiochus Epiphanes did not fulfill all the prophecy, but he gives us a, a good uh, indication of what to expect. He shall turn his face to the coastlands and shall capture, but a commander shall put an end to his insolence, but he shall tumble and fall and shall not be found. Okay. So these kings of the south and kings of the north, let's look at them on paper, on a map, to kind of give us an idea geographically how um, the historical uh, fulfillment will probably be a type and a shadow of what the end time fulfillment will be. So um, if that's the case, then the king of the north would be the Seleucid Empire, which we see uh, everything up to the border of India, so uh, up in Afghanistan, uh, Turkmenistan, um, and then of course Iran and Turkey, uh, all that area. And then the king of the south being primarily Egypt. Um, but uh, this is also in 275 BC. So uh, these boundaries expanded and contracted, but this is just a snapshot in time. Now, when we look at these two kingdoms on a modern day map and what countries they represent, uh, this is what we see here. So you have uh, the king of the south, everything from Libya, Egypt, Sudan, Ethiopia, and then the king of the north, which is as far east as Jordan, far north as Turkey, uh, Syria, Iraq, all the way east to uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Tajikistan. But look, who they surround. And that in itself should give us a very strong clue of what is yet to come. And that is we have these countries, these empires that have built themselves up surrounding what? God's chosen people, God's chosen land, God's chosen city of Jerusalem. So, that is no coincidence. Let me just say that. So let's read on. Verse 21, because here's where things start to get, uh, start to transition and start to really get into a eschatological end time context. Verse 21, in his place. So that's telling us that... Uh, Somebody is taken out and he's going to be replaced by another person. And his place shall rise <coughs> a contemptible person. So that's already telling us uh, this fits the mold of the Antichrist perfectly. To whom royal majesty has not been given. So he's not going to come from royalty. Nobody even knows where he comes from. It's just like he pops up from the shadows. And it's like, where did he come from? And how come he is so popular? And how come there's such a following on him? Because this was given to him. Okay. Um, he shall come with, in without warning. So it's all going to happen quickly. And he's going to obtain the kingdom by flatteries. Now, what does that mean? That means he will lie. He will tell you what your ears want to hear. He will manipulate, make false promises. He will pull strings. Um, sounds like a politician, but we're not going to go there. Verse 22. Armies 
shall be utterly swept away before him and broken, even the prince of the covenant. So what is this saying? What this is saying is that there is going to be a violent, quick, brutal military conquest in the Middle East. And it will be swift, it will be violent, and it will definitely head west towards the glorious land, towards Egypt, um, even though it will not be the first destination uh, because the Antichrist is going to have to uh, take care of, uh, of allies and those that are kind of aligned more with Israel. Uh, but even the prince of the covenant will be broken, and that would be the Israeli army. Verse 23. And from the time that an alliance is made with him, he shall act deceitfully, and he shall become strong with a small people. So the Antichrist is going to make alliances, pacts, coalitions, treaties, accords with various nations. In fact, in Revelation, we'll see that it, it, it happens with 10, but out of those 10, there's going to be three that uh, he's not going to be happy with. But that's for our Revelation discussion. But he will become strong with a small people. So in other words, what, we're, what this is saying is that these alliances, uh, this, uh, uh, this overtaking and all that, it's not going to be with major powerful nations, okay? It will be with smaller countries. Um, now, where that break-off is, is, is anyone's guess, but uh, um, that's what we read in this. Verse 24. Without warning... He shall come into the richest parts of the province. So what is this? Well, when we stop and put this in a Middle East context, what are the richest part of the province? It's those that are oil producing nations, right? It's those members of OPEC. They're, they're the ones that literally have the money pumping up out of the ground. Uh, in a um, revelation context, it could probably include the harlot Babylon, which is to be like a rich uh, financial city or city-state. We'll, we'll see how that comes down. And he shall do what neither his fathers nor his father's fathers had done scattering among them plunder, spoil, and goods. He shall devise plans against strongholds, but only for a short time. And this is a very important phrase because it's, what he's saying is he's going to devise plans against the powers to be in the Middle East, but the Antichrist is not going to be all-conquering. It's going to be a battle. It's going to be a battle even amongst themselves. Remember the, uh, uh, the vision of the feet and the toes and the mixed marriage and, and the internal conflict that's going to be in his own kingdom. And this is what's going to happen. Um, so the Antichrist is not going to be all conquering. So let's read on verse 25. And he shall stir up his power and his heart against the king of the south with a great army. And the king of the south shall wage war with an exceedingly great and mighty army. But he shall not stand, for plots shall be devised against him. Okay, there's a lot here. Uh, he, being uh, the Antichrist, shall stir up his power and his heart. And this is going to be something that's going to be very important in understanding the, 
the Antichrist is that what motivates him? What is in his heart? Is it power and conquest and wealth? No, it's not. It is hatred. It's hatred that motivates the Antichrist. Remember, the Antichrist is what? Satan incarnate. Satan is fully possessed, um, um, or the Antichrist is fully possessed by Satan. And what is it that Satan is so angry about? He's angry about being kicked out of heaven. He's angry that God uh, has his chosen people, his chosen nation, uh, his chosen throne, um, his covenant, which is the covenant of Abraham. And that's what motivates Satan. Okay, the king of the south is most likely Egypt. Uh, and we'll see this later on in chapter 11, starting around verse 42. But if we put this in today's context, you have these Islamic nations that are surrounding Egypt, correction, they're surrounding Israel, and some of them are not so hateful against Israel. In fact, they kind of have partnership agreements. Uh, they even have uh, uh, really a reliance on Israel that if Israel were to fall, their own economies would fall. And in particular, uh, this would include Jordan. But Jordan is not as big a power as Egypt. Um, and Egypt has more than once been known to help Israel in their times of trouble. Um, and the king of the south shall wage war, but he shall not stand, for plots will, shall be devised against him. So Egypt, he will lose, they will lose the battle. Um, evidently, there will be... Uh, uh, those within um, the Israeli uh, leadership that will come against Israel, I'm correct, come against Egypt in, in, internally. One, another reason why we think this is Egypt is found in Isaiah 19.4, where God himself says in these last days, Egypt is gonna pay a very terrible price where it says, and I will give over the Egyptians into the hand of a hard master. So that would be the Antichrist. And a fierce king will rule over them, declares the Lord God of hosts. So let's read on. First of all, kind of a reminder of what we're looking at geographically when we're looking at king of the north versus king of the south. And of course, we know what's in between all this is Israel. Uh, can they skirt Israel? Yes, of course, going through Syria and Jordan or Saudi Arabia even. But let's move on. Verse 26. Even those who eat his food shall break him. His army shall be swept away and many shall fall down slain. So this is telling us that even those that are around the the, the dinner table with the Egyptian king, um, they will probably be part of a coup inside of Egypt. Verse 27, as, and as for the two kings, their hearts shall be bent on doing evil. They shall speak lies at the same table, but to no avail for the end is yet to be at the time appointed. So, I mean, these are, it's almost like evil king against evil king, one being more powerful than the other, both telling each other lies, making promises at the table. But at the end, it's he who has the military might that will win. And this is the, this is the Middle East way of um, conquering. It's not really by negotiation, it's by military. Verse 28. And he shall return to his land, that being the Antichrist, with great wealth, with all of his plunder. But listen to this. But his heart shall be set against the Holy Covenant. And he shall work his will and return to his own land. Okay? So the Antichrist is returning to, uh, to his homeland. Uh, chances are... That's uh, 
to the north and to uh, um, the east of um, Israel, uh, but his heart, that which motivates him, shall be set against the Holy Covenant. This is what motivates the Antichrist, because this is what motivates Satan, is this deep-seated hatred against God's holy Abrahamic covenant concerning his people and concerning his promised land, Israel. Now you might say, well, wait a minute, We're, you're, you're talking about Satan and the Antichrist, but um, are, are you sure this is all the Arab people? Well, yes, because the Arabs hate the Jews and hate Israel intensely. Well, but then you ask the question, well, why, why is it they hate the Jewish people? Why do they hate Israel so intensely? Well, I think it goes all the way back to the Holy Covenant. And we're going to read in several places the, the hatred against the Holy Covenant. What's the Holy Covenant? The Holy Covenant is the Abrahamic Covenant. Okay, so why would that make the Arabs so angry? Well, who is their roots? The Arabs come from Ishmael, right? Ish, uh, Ishmael is what? Abraham's first son, his first son from Hagar. But that was Abraham not abiding to God's wishes, but abiding to Sarah's wishes, where Sarah just says, hey, you know, just take my handmaiden and just um, have a child with her. That was not what the Abrahamic covenant was all about. So it was not the first son of Abraham, which was illegitimate in the eyes of God, but the second son of Abraham, which is the firstborn in the eyes of God. And so in one sense, I really believe the Arab nations feel like that they have been cheated out of a covenant with God. So let's move on. And he returns to his own land. We've already talked about that. So, verse 29. At the time appointed, he shall return. And that means returning back to Egypt and come into the south. But it will not be this time as it was before. For, for ships of Kittim shall come against him, and he shall be afraid. You hearing this? The Antichrist will be afraid and will withdraw, and he shall turn back in all uh, humiliation. And that is going to make him enraged and be enraged and take action against what? Who? Why? Take action against the Holy Covenant. He shall turn back and pay attention to those who forsake the Holy Covenant. So to those that are like the Antichrist, they have this deep unseated hatred to the Jewish people, to the nation of Israel. Um, uh, they will be quickly become friends with the Antichrist. Um, but the interesting thing here is that the might of opposing military forces scare him and makes him embarrassed, which will enrage him to go after Israel. Verse 31. Forces from him shall appear and profane the temple and fortress. So the Antichrist armies are now in Israel and shall take away the burnt offering. So that tells us that there's already a third temple and there's already ongoing burnt offering. And they shall set up the abomination that makes desolate. Okay, so this is a very pivotal verse. This is when the Antichrist, and notice it says, um, 
forces and, and and they shall set up the abomination. So it's not just the Antichrist by himself, but it's with his his um, his army, uh, with those that uh, he has formed alliance with because they both hate the, the Holy Co Covenant. But this is when he takes over the temple. He stops the regular sacrifice. He establishes the abomination of desolation as foretold by Jesus Christ. Now, everything up to this point, as terrible as it is, and it, it's really more of a, a Middle East, Israel focus campaign. But now we start the great tribulation that Jesus Christ warns about, where he says in Matthew 24, uh, starting verse 15, so when you see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by the prophet Daniel, which is the reason why we're going through the book of Daniel, standing in the holy place, that will be uh, in the holy of holies in, in uh, the third temple, let the reader understand. This is why it's so important to read and understand Daniel. For then there will be great tribulation such as not been from the beginning of the world until now and no will never be. So what can we summarize from this? We now have 42 months until we see the Lord's return. And then this present evil age as we know it today will be over. And not only will it be over, but it'll be over forever. Verse 32, he shall seduce with flattery those who violate the covenant, but the people who know their God shall stand firm and take action. So the Jews will be fighting back. But we know how that story goes. And verse 33, and the wise among the people shall make many understand. This is such an important verse. And in one sense, it should be a mission statement to everyone studying Revelation and studying uh, Daniel, that if we by any chance live to experience this, we got to huge ministry that we can be part of. The wise, the masculine means men who show wisdom. So saints that know what is going on, that understands um, the prophecies of Daniel, that understands um, the seals and the trumpets, um, they will be a powerful witness leading many to Christ. This could be the church's finest hour in evangelism because so much is going on and people are going to be in a meltdown mode. Uh, even those that might even profess to be Christians, but they're having their faith totally shattered and they're concerning, turning away uh, from the church, because they felt like they've been betrayed, but ultimately turning away from Jesus Christ. And this is where uh, those in the know can, can with a calm, steady hand say, let me explain this to you. Do not lose faith. Now is the time to stand firm. This is what has happened and this is why. And this is what to expect in the future and why we need to stand firm because the clock is ticking and God's kingdom is coming and the, the Lord Jesus Christ himself is gonna come down and rescue us all. So this is why it's so important to, to study Daniel. This is why it's so important to, to study Revelation because uh, Unless we are aware of what we could possibly experience in our lifetime, we would be caught 
unaware. We would be blindsided. We would have to mentally process all these emotions of, of what is unexpected. But if we know what to expect, then we have the time to mentally process um, what could happen in our lifetime. We could mentally process how we're going to act and react. And because of that, in this time of, of people just going nuts and being in meltdown mode, we can have a calm, steady hand and be that voice of reason and that voice of truth and that voice of guidance that can lead many to Christ. However, let's read on. As the wise among the people shall make many understand, though for some days they shall stumble by sword and flame, by captivity and plunder. Remember what it says in Revelation about the saints. If they go into captivity, they go into captivity. If they, if they fall by the sword, they will fall by the sword. So all that to say is the great tribulation, which is Satan's wrath, is poured out on God's people. God's people are going to be there to, 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 to face against Satan's wrath, to endure. And it's going to call for patience. It's going to call for endurance. And remember, Satan's wrath is not being poured out on the worldly folks. They're on his side. It's being poured out on Israel, his hatred, the Jewish people, his hatred, the church, because the church now is a recipient of the Abrahamic covenant. And the church now uh, is uh, aligned with the Messiah, who is his mortal enemy, that being Satan's. So once again, this is, this is clear text that tells us that the saints will have to endure uh, the tribulation of Satan's wrath. And in verse 35, and some of the wise shall stumble so that they may be refined, purified, and made white until, until another important thing, until the time of the end, for it still awaits the appointed time. So there's this refinement, this is purification, this being made white, which is part of God's plan for his people, his people both of, of Israel and of the church. God is refining his church. He's purifying, preparing uh, his, her to be his bride. Okay, uh, and this is, this is like right out of Revelations chapter six and the fifth seal. Um, but, and then, but more importantly, until the time of the end. Once again, context is being set that leaves no doubt, no wiggle room of what this vision concerns, and that is the end of time. This vision is not historical, even though we have partial fulfillment by, for example, Antiochus Epiphanes, but Antiochus Epiphanes never fulfilled what the vision says shall be fulfilled. So let's look real quick at the fifth seal, Revelation 6, verse 9. When he, the Lamb, Jesus Christ, opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and they were told what? To rest a little longer. Why? Until the number of their fellow servants, their fellow saints, those who, who, are, who are covered by the blood of the Lamb and hold to the testimony of Jesus Christ and love their lives not even unto death, those are the ones we're talking about. Their fellow saints and their brothers should be complete who were to be killed as they themselves had been. So what Jesus is saying is that there's or what these people are being told by Jesus or, or, or the God the Father is, wait, 
because I'm still refining my people. I'm still refining the church. And there's going to be a remnant in Israel that I have to refine. And then, then it all goes forward. Verse 36. And the king shall do as he wills. He shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every God and speak astonishing things against the God of gods. Okay, so the Antichrist, he's going to exalt himself and magnify himself above every God. Now, do you think he really believes that he is the God of all gods? No. In his heart, he knows he's been kicked out of heaven. His time is short, but in utter contempt and utter defiance, he will do whatever he can to spit in the face of God. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 explains it quite well. Uh, in that day, correction, for that day will not come. That day being the coming of the Lord, of the the, the resurrection of the dead, the rapture of the saints, unless the rebellion comes first, which we're seeing here in Daniel, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, which we're seeing here in Daniel, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he, in utter defiance and utter contempt, takes his seat, in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God and the world needs to worship me. Now, this was also foretold in Ezekiel and Jeremiah, Ezekiel 43. Uh, while the man, that being an angel, was standing beside me, um, I heard one speaking to me out of the temple. Now, this is the, the third temple vision. And he said to me, son of man, this is the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet where I will dwell in the midst of the people of Israel forever. So uh, who was Ezekiel hearing from? The Messiah, our Lord Jesus Christ. And the house of Israel shall no more defile my holy name neither they nor the, their kings by their whoring and by the dead bodies of their kings at their high places. And Jeremiah was shown in verse uh, chapter 3, verse 17. At that time, we know what at that time means in, in Old Testament speak. That means the, the coming of the Lord, uh, the day of the Lord, uh, the parousia in New Testament Greek, at that time, Jerusalem shall be called the throne of the Lord and all nations shall gather to it, to the presence of the Lord in Jerusalem and they shall no more stubbornly follow their own evil heart. In Jesus' own words in all of the discourse, Matthew 25, 31, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. And the king shall do as he wills. He shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every God, he shall speak astonishing things against the God of gods. He shall prosper till the indignation is accomplished, but what is decreed shall be done. Um, this is the full manifestation of Satan incarnate in man, acting in utter defiance. Um, verse 37, he shall pay no attention to the gods of his fathers or to the one beloved by woman. He shall not pay attention to any other God, for he shall magnify himself above all. Um, so he shall not pay attention to the gods of his fathers. This is not so good of a translation, in my opinion. In Hebrew, it's Elohim. Ab Elohim, remember, is uh, in the beginning. Elohim, God, is a common reference to God the Father. 
or our God, the triune God. Uh, and the God of fathers, of his fathers, is a frequent reference to the Lord himself, Yahweh. Um, and then as for to the one beloved by women, well, before the Messiah was born, so we're talking Old Testament still, the one beloved by woman was a Hebrew phrase for the Messiah because it was the desire of the Hebrew woman back then to be the chosen one to bear the Messiah. Verse 38. He shall honor the God of fortresses instead of these, a God whom his fathers did not know. He shall honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and costly gifts. He shall deal with the strongest fortresses with the help of a foreign God. Those who acknowledge him, he shall load with honor. He shall make them rulers over many and shall divide the land for a price. So who is this God of fortresses? Um, basically, the interpretation is that his confidence, the confidence of the Antichrist, will be in military might, which is, as we said earlier, the normal means of conquering in the Middle East. And this is something that we see right out of the first seal, the white horseman, where it says, And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and its rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him, was given to him, and he came out conquering and to conquer. So right off the bat in the first seal, we're seeing the emergence of the Antichrist. But a God whom his fathers did not know, we'll stop and think about it, um, if this is uh, uh, a, the, re, the resurrection of the Islamic Caliphate, the Ottoman Empire, that is uh, all about Islam and the, uh, the teaching of conquering that is taught in Islam. Well, remember, Islam did not come on the scene until the 7th century AD. So, this would not this this would not be a god whom his fathers had known and the allah of islam it could be understood as the god of war of jihad so let's move on at the time on the end of the end once again so we're setting the context this is the the end of days not historical the king of the south shall attack him but the king of the north shall rush upon him like a whirlwind with chariots and horsemen and with many ships. So, and he shall come into countries and shall overflow and pass through. He shall come into the glorious land, that being Israel, and tens of thousands shall fall. But these shall be delivered out of his hand, Edom and Moab and the main part of the Amorites. So once again, this is, a vision concerning the end of days. Um, we're seeing now forces are coming against the Antichrist. Um, and Edom and Moab and the main part of the Amorites, they will be delivered out of his hand. So shall we say from the allied forces, uh, not the axes of evil, uh, the, the allied forces will come to their rescue and uh, modern-day Jordan and Saudi Arabia uh, will uh, be uh, rescued, so to speak. Verse 42, he shall stretch out his hand against the countries and the land of Egypt shall not escape. So once again, Egypt just gets pummeled by the Antichrist. He shall become ruler of the treasures of gold and of silver and all the precious things of Egypt and the Libyans so North Africa and the Cushites, which is uh, south of Egypt along the Nile River, shall follow in his train. So they're aligned with the Antichrist and his army. But then news from the east and the north shall alarm him and, sh and he shall go out with great fury to destroy and devote many to destruction. So the opposing nations are coming into the Antichrist. He's being forced to retreat. Now he is cornered. He knows his, 
his days, maybe hours are numbered. He just doesn't know. But what he does know is that he's going to take out as many as he can. If you're going to take me out, I'm going to take out and destroy everything in my path for destruction's faith sake. Verse 45, and he shall pitch his palatial tents between the sea and the glorious holy mountain. Okay, between the sea, that would be the Mediterranean Sea. The glorious holy mountain, that would be Mount Zion. So what is in between the sea and the holy mountain? It's Ben Gurion Airport. It's right smack in between Jerusalem and Tel Aviv, which is on the Mediterranean Sea. His palatial tents, that's... that's uh, I had to look it up. It means luxurious, spacious, palace-like tents. And then we have this last sentence. Yet he shall come to his end with none to help him. He's defeated. But in this vision, it's not explained very clearly how he's defeated or from whom he's defeated. All we know is he shall come to his end. However, if we use Daniel to interpret Daniel, scripture to interpret scripture, we could go back, for example, Daniel chapter 2, in two ver verse uh, 34, where we're told that there's a stone that was cut up by no human hand, and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay, that image being the last kingdom, the kingdom of the Antichrist. And what? Broke them in pieces. In verse 44, still in Daniel 2, the God of heaven shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. And this is kind of like recapitulated in Daniel 7, verses 11 and 26. Let's move on, because now we need to get into chapter 12. And uh, he's running out of time, and we're running out of time. So let's read on. Verse one, at that time, that's a very, very important phrase. At that time, at what time? Well, during all this going on, not after that going on, but at that time, the time that we've already read about in Daniel 11 verses 21 and 45, at that time shall arise Michael, the great prince, who has charge of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. What are we talking about here? This is the tribulation. Okay, and shall arise Michael. That's already been explained in part in, in Revelation chapter 12, where Michael and his angels throw Satan and his angels out of heaven. Well, this conquest is still going on. But there shall be a time of trouble. This is Jesus Christ. He basically just quoted this out of Daniel when he was explaining the end times in his Olivet Discourse, where he said, Matthew 24, 21, for then there shall be great tribulation at that time, such has not been from the beginning of the world until now. No, it never will be. Let's read on. But at that time, so something else is going on. But at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone whose name shall be found in the book. So, I mean, even Jesus Christ said, if, it, if, if I didn't intervene, even the elect, everybody would be destroyed. So at that time, that's the second coming of Christ. Verse 2, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. This is the clearest reference in the Old Testament to the resurrection. This is the resurrection of the dead. Some to everlasting life, that's the first resurrection. 
uh, which is also going to happen concurrently with the rapture of the saints. Remember in 1 Thessalonians 4, for this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, those that are still standing alive, will not proceed, not go in front of those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven. This is the charge that we see in Revelation 19 with the cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God, which we're gonna really hone in on in Revelation. And what? The dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the air, the, the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. But there's more to this resurrection, some to shame and everlasting contempt. And this will be the second resurrection, um, which, um, and those will face the great white throne of judgment at the end of the millennium. Found in Revelations 20, verses five through 15. Let's read on. Verse three, and those who are wise, remember this is the masculine, those that, uh, that knew what was going on, that was ministering uh, to others, that were leading others into the kingdom of God. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above. And those who turn many to righteousness, those who were evangelizing during all of this, like the stars forever and ever. A special mention, a special blessing to these wise people for their role in leading others to Jesus Christ. Verse four, but you, Daniel, shut up the words, seal the book until the time of the end Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. So basically what he's saying is, first and foremost, it's not for now because this is at the end of the time, so shut that uh, book up. Knowledge, however, shall increase as mankind gets closer to the end of age. Uh, God is going to increase the knowledge and understanding of what's to come. And basically that pretty much started with the New Testament apostles. Look at all that we've read uh, from Jesus, from Paul, uh, from John, from Revelation. Um, the wise among the people shall make many understand. Verse five. And then I, Daniel, looked and behold, two others stood, one on this bank, bank of the stream and one on that bank of the stream. And someone said to the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the stream, how long shall it be till the end of these wonders? Now we've said this before, but when an angel asks an angel or a third angel to explain, um, it's not for their sakes, it's for our sake. And I heard him, the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the stream, he raised his right hand and his left hand towards heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it will be for a time, times, and half a time. So a time, times, and half a time, three and a half years. And that when the shattering of the power of the holy people comes to an end, all this refining, all this purification, all this time of tribulation, then all these things will be finished. So how long will it be? Well, the end event is not clearly defined. What is defined is that it will begin uh, with the rise of the Antichrist, his campaign, the setting up the abomination of desolation, the great tribulation. But exactly what that end point is that uh, the, the angel was referring to, we're not totally clear. It could be Jesus' second coming. It could be the battle of Armageddon. It could be the new covenant, covenant with Israel. It could be the judging of the nations. It could be the marriage supper of the Lamb. But what we do know is it's time, times, and half a time. And as we said, when the shattering of the people of a holy people come to an end, that's the remnant of the Jewish people um, that are rescued by Jesus Christ. 
and God's work with them is finished, um, as well as the saints that were martyred. Let's move on. Verse 8. I heard, but I did not understand. Daniel, we feel for you. Then I said, oh, my Lord, what, what, what shall be the outcome of these things? Because, I mean, what's been thrown to Daniel is just it's traumatic. It's, it's unbelievable. It's beyond imagination. But what did the angel say? He said, go your way, Daniel, for the words are shut up and sealed until the time of the end. Many shall purify themselves and make themselves white and be refined, but the wicked shall act wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but those who are wise shall understand. So many shall purify themselves and make themselves white and be refined. This could be a reference to those uh, coming out of the great tribulation. Uh, remember in Revelation 7, 13, uh, these, and this is the multitude of people uh, that um, are now standing in front of the throne of God. These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and have made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And he goes on to say, none of the wicked shall understand. Why? Because they're spiritually blinded. Explain in 2 Thessalonians. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders, as Jesus said, to deceive even the elect, if that was possible. But back to Thessalonians, verse 10. And with all wicked deception for those who are perishing. Why? Because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. There will be many that are not interested in the truth. It's sad, but it's true. And then verse 11, therefore God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false. Very, very sad. And then he says, and from the time that the regular burnt offering is taken away and the abomination that makes desolate is set up, okay, that all happens simultaneously, concurrently, there shall be 1,290 days, okay? Once again, 1,290 days until what exactly? It's not clearly, we're not clearly told, but what we're now seeing is 1,290 days. We've seen 1,260, we've seen three and a half years, we've seen time, times, and half a time. Now we got an extra 30 days tacked on. It's not clearly defined. Well, we don't know. One possibility is that it could take 30 extra days to clean up the mess and restore the temple after the Battle of Armageddon. A lot of this is explained in uh, uh, Ezekiel 38, 39, where it, you know, it's explained that it's, they're even going to find dead bodies up to six months after all this happening. Um, we just don't know. Uh, but what we do know is that there's 1,290 days here and then verse 12, blessed is he who waits and arrives at the 1335 days. Blessed is he who waits and arrives. Arrives at the 1335 days. So what happens to this additional 45 days that are attacked now? So now we got 1260 plus 30 plus 45. Well, arrives gives us a clue. It could be an arrival to a formal event. It could be the coronation of Jesus Christ as the millennial king. I'm sure that will be a formal ceremony. It could be the marriage of the lamb. That could be a formal ceremony or his marriage supper. That is definitely going to be a formal ceremony. And preparing for such an event could explain the extra 45 days. Remember, uh, the the second coming and the millennial kingdom, especially the establishment of, of, of uh, cleaning up uh, Jerusalem and Israel and, and uh, the battle of Armageddon, it's, it's going to be physical. It's not going to be a blink of the eye like a genie and it's all disappeared. And preparing for such an event uh, would explain the extra 45 days. Um, and for the marriage supper, well, there's a hint there in Revelation 19.9. And the angel said to me, write this, 
Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. So anyway, we don't know for sure, and that's okay, because what we do know is the intent of the vision. And then we got one more verse. But go your way till the end, Daniel, and you shall rest and shall stand in your allotted place at the end of the days. So go your way, Daniel. You've done your service. In fact, you're in your advanced years. Your time is coming. You shall rest. But, 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 you shall stand in your allotted place at the end of the days. And I can hear the Lord saying, well done, my good and faithful servant. Okay, so that concludes Daniel, the book of Daniel and chapters 10, 11, 12. And from here, we will go back to Revelation and the breaking of the seals.